Hi, my name is Joseph, uh, Joseph Lawrence. I'm a um, software engineer at Red Hat and working in the uh, live patching project. And um, Marcos and I will give you an overview of kernel live patching. Next slide. So for today's agenda, it's kind of a high level introduction um, to the subject. We'll go over a brief history um, and introduction about why you might want to live patch a kernel. Uh, and then we'll talk about um, a little bit of the history and get into um, competing RFCs from KPatch and KGraft. And then later how um, the groups collaborated upstream um, to implement live patching in Linux and then eventually um, enhance it. And of course, we'll show uh, some examples, um, simple um, simple demos of, of how live patching would work. Uh, and then, of course, talk about uh, maybe the limitations and um, why why you might not live patch something or, or when does it get difficult. Um, so the scope here is that this is an introduction. This is only you know an hour talk. Um, so we'll try to give you the so all the highlights, but uh, also some details. We'll, we'll dive into some examples and even some things like disassembly uh, and whatnot. Um, and at the end, there's right, an introduction to the risks of live patching. When, when does it get fun? And uh, what resources you might look uh, for additional information about writing the patches or applying them. Okay, next slide. Previous slide. Okay, so why live patching? Um, I think most definitive answer is, an obvious answer is security. Um, so we have a little uh, toot here from Thorsten um, where he noted that the Linux uh, CVE uh, team had published their uh, thousandth CVE. Um, and I think in the course of creating the slides for this presentation, when we started, there were only hundreds that they had logged. And as you see now, there's over a thousand. Um, so um, the kernel um, itself, there's a kernel team that is a CNA and they're responsible for numbering CVEs and they're going back and researching um, previous commits and assigning them the CVEs. So um, the main problem uh, that I think system administrators face is uh, a dilemma of uptime versus security, right? Rebooting some servers can push um, it can take a very long line of time. Uh, you might have applications like databases, which take very long time to kind of create a hot cache. Um, you may have lots of uh, hypervisor guests that are not migratable. Um, basically, uh, you don't want to reboot to a new kernel. So uh, live patching provides an opportunity to sort of maintain uh, and keep pace with security fixes without suffering uh, the downtime freebooting. So who's creating live patches? Now, I don't think this is a definitive list here, um, but I think uh, we wanted to provide you just a, a sample of um, you know, the players who have embraced this technology and, and are creating these for their customers. Um, everybody from Oracle, AWS, SUSE, Tux care, et cetera. So in explaining uh, kernel life patching and Linux, um, I think an appropriate place to start is the K-Splice project. Um, a lot of people, for a lot of people, I think that was synonymous with, with kernel patching, um, especially in the beginning. Uh, so take a brief tour, sort of down memory lane and then bring it into uh, current day. So in 2008, um, an MIT student, Jeff Arnold, um, he uh, wrote a paper for I think his master's project uh, about automating system you know, for rebootless kernel security updates. Uh, I believe he was a kernel or a system administrator um, and he had deferred um, a security update. And I think one of his machines might have been hacked. So he had some, some motivations to, uh, to create this project. Um, so when we share the slides, um, you could either Google you know, the, the paper title here, or you can pro 
follow the link that will be in the slides. Um, the paper is not that long. Um, maybe it's a half hour, hour read. It's, um, I think, very approachable. He explains some, some of the problems that he faced in 2008 um, in creating this technology, um, and some of them are even true today. So after him, he submitted this for his, his master's project, um, he had also announced and, and submitted the, the project to the Linux kernel mailing list uh, later that year. Um, and subsequently, the following year, uh, he created KPatch Incorporated um, and then started providing kernel live patching as a service uh, to customers. And this was eventually acquired by Oracle a few years later, um, and fortunately now closed source. Um, that said, it continues on. Um, you could follow and read the case place project on, on Oracle's page, but uh, as far as the Linux community goes, um, the only source code that we that we had um, that was open source was from the original uh, the original um, submissions from Jeff uh, in two thousand eight. So I'll summarize the paper um, that he wrote because I think um, these key concepts still sort of hold true today, or at least uh, lead us to the next step. Um, so as far as patching um, kernel, uh, case splice operated on uh, a function granularity. And so he chose this um, because most C functions, they have one entry point. Um, and then there is an existing mechanism um, that allowed him to, to hook into functions. Then finding uh, a safe time to update. Um, so because he was um, case place implemented this um, at a function granularity and implemented at the beginning of the function, um, the paper explains how it was not safe to be patching functions uh, if they were being mid-executed by, by threats. Um, you don't want to patch something that uh, a CPU might be running. So in the way that they had accomplished this was via the kernel's stop machine uh, call. We'll explain stop machine in a few slides. Um, so another interesting aspect was uh, he could not uh, upgrade non-quiescent kernel functions like schedule. Um, and we'll explain this in a bit as well. And then the last two um, concepts are that case splice patches were loaded via kernel modules. Um, so these are just like sort of like ordinary kernel modules that you might load for device drivers, things like that. Case splice provided new code uh, and the patching mechanism uh, via the typical kernel loadable module. Final uh, aspect of case place uh, was the ability to stack and apply subsequent hot patches, uh, right? What good is one update if you can't have the next update? So unfortunately, um, like I said, since Oracle purchased um, uh, case place uh, and closed source, the community um, sort of left without an open source kernel live patching uh, implementation. So in this slide, um, we also document um, two RFCs that were posted a few years later, about at the same time. Seems coincidental, but um, uh, so on, uh, in April, the end of April, uh, Suse um, folks had posted an RFC about some um, project called KGraft. And in this project, um, they did not use the stop machine uh, mechanism that, that Case Place was using, but what they were doing is um, migrating every kernel thread um, as it was safe to migrate that thread. And to achieve this, that meant that, that transitioning from, from pre-patched to, to patched code would, would occur only when that task exited kernel mode. In contrast, uh, Red Hat um, had developed a project called KPatch. Um, and in comparison to KGraph, I think it was largely modeled after the initial KSplice project. Um, 
it leveraged stop machine call in which you, know, you had um, uh, a pre-stop machine world with everybody was running old code and a, a post-stop machine world. The entire machine was running new code. Um, and one of the uh, requirements of this approach um, is that it needed to analyze um, what all the tasks were doing on the machine. So it had to essentially unwind the stack of, of uh, the threads on the machine to try to determine if they were uh, currently sitting in the functions that, that may need to be patched. Um, next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the in two implementations, or in, in, in some regards, almost a, a re-implementation. Um, and so first of all, we'll, we'll start with what, what was common to these two approaches. Um, and that was the most obvious part is that they, they both leveraged um, kernel facility um, called ftrace. And unlike an ordinary um, ftrace where you might might be just monitoring or recording functions as they execute. Um, we're leveraging it to um, replace or re replace functions. So the way that this is accomplished, uh, sort of depict it here, um, the functions in the kernel have uh, a little call at the beginning, which we will explain in the beginning, uh, in another slide. Um, has a little space at the beginning where we can essentially detour their execution. So an original function, um, we can detour into a, an ftrace handler, uh, which then calls new patched uh, version of that function. And then instead of returning to the original function, we can return to um, the function that had called our original function. So I suppose this is a, another crucial, I think, uh, aspect with live patching is that we're not really literally patching code in memory. We're essentially setting up uh, detours uh, in the um, execution flow. So, okay, um, these are, um, we're going to provide a little example of how you might, might see this uh, sort of redirection occurring even in user space code. Um, so if you had ever used GCC's profiling option um, and looked at the disassembly, um, you, you might see that uh, what was put at the beginning of your functions was a five byte sequence in which um, it's dropped a call instruction with a, a relocation to something called mcal. And in user space, this just gives you an, an opportunity maybe to record the, the number of times a function got called or maybe some latency numbers um, and things like that. Um, if you were to follow the, the example link here to there's a compiler explorer, um, you could literally play with the uh, build options and or play with the functions and see how, uh, how that, that sort of sequence gets built into uh, object code. But we're here to talk about the kernel. Um, so we just provided that previous slide to kind of show you. This is, um, I think, how a lot of people's understanding starts with user space. We need five bytes to call something. The problem is essentially the same in the kernel. Um, and so for ftrace, um, it turns on the uh, optimization switch. And then instead of calling uh, a user space, um, profiling option, um, it just gets uh, it changed into something called F entry. So function entry or F trace entry. Um, if you were to read the F trace documentation, you read all about that in gory details. Uh, I think the too long didn't read is that when you boot your machine up, dynamic F trace turns all of those into uh, all no ops. So then um, your functions have a little extra padding at the beginning so that you could dynamically engage ftrace to redirect them later. Okay. Um, the next slide or two, sort of uh, background slides, um, just in case, uh, sort of provide context later of how we created the examples. If somebody needs to grab um, a kernel tree, 
we're going to build, uh, build uh, an object file in the kernel to sort of demonstrate uh, what, it, what it looks like. So these uh, are the configuration options that we set for live patching um, based on a default kernel. And slide. So, right. So, what does this look like in the kernel? Uh, if we were to build um, the procfs command line object file, it uh, looks pretty much the same. Um, in, in this case, we're doing a, an OBJ dump disassembly of the text. Uh, we want to see the beginning of the command proc show function. Um, you ignore the part about end br. Uh, what we want to focus on is that there's an F entry call um, at the beginning of the function. Uh, and this will be the same across the kernel for, for all the traceable functions that, that you can hook with F trace. So F trace was fundamental and um, common to both K graft and K patch RFCs. I just want to talk about then well, what what are the differences? And I think this is probably the, the most interesting part of the, the two competing approaches. So K patch used something called stop machine. Um, that kernel API does literally what it says. It like stops the machine, it stops all the all the code that's executing on all the CPUs. On the other hand, KGraph implemented what you might call a lazy approach, um, in which case uh, tasks are migrated to running patched code uh, as they are safe to do so. So a machine would converge on a patch state. Um, you might think of this maybe like a like an RCU sort of mechanism. Um, you know, the the older code like ages out. So stop machine, um, I'll try to turn this into a picture. Um, I think it's mainly regarded as um, a, a simpler simpler approach, at least to implement. Um, and so the picture here tries to show four tasks running on a machine. You then interrupt all of them um, in a stop machine uh, context. You then run tests to determine if it's safe to patch. If it is, then you do it. If it's not, then you, you don't. And you then perhaps try again later. Um, so the cons are that uh, you might have to try it many times if the machine is very busy and executing code that you want to patch. Um, but on the other hand, um, you really only have, I think, two worlds, like two states to worry about, not patched and patched. Um, the cost is perhaps latency. Um, stop machine. If you run that on um, a very large machine, it does take some time to sort of uh, corral all the CPUs uh, through the, like I said, uh, the interrupt mechanism. So on the other hand, KGraft. Just, sorry, Joe. There is a question um, in the question Q and A that says, would it be necessary to reboot and fall back to the regular? patch slash upgrade procedure if the live patches pile up too much. Would you like to address that now or later? Um, I'll give you a quick answer. And then I think I will mention, we will we will talk a little bit, I think about uh, multiple patching. Um, I, I think the quick answer it would be, it depends. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. So we'll get, we'll get to it in a couple of slides. Um, Right, so KGraft had proposed um, a, a different uh, model and patching tasks. Uh, in this case, you'll see um, a KGraft will, will process will sort of be in progress, and that may take as long as it takes to migrate all of the tasks on the machine. Um, so you could certainly consider new tasks, anything that's created after this as being patched, but for the, uh, the machine, you know, the ones that are running, um, you, you sort of have to look at them um, as it's safe to do so. And I think it was done uh, as these tasks uh, crossed the kernel um, sort of user mode. Um, some considered this more conceptually complex. Next slide. 
then the question was which yeah which one to uh which one to to merge upstream and now we get to the collaboration side i think of the rfcs so marcos are you going to talk about that yeah sure so uh once we have two approaches to resolve the same problem the kernel community requested for a single api and a single live patch approach uh, some thought that maybe this top machine was a simpler way to just have live patch working on the kernel, but then no apparent uh, bugs were found on the per task approach too, but it couldn't still uh, migrate K thread either. So, but um, how this worked? So, and then some months after the two RFCs were proposed, the first patch was introduced into the kernel uh, for the live patching core. Um, and it represented the, the, the common functionality for both approaches that used F-trace to live patch. And, and at this point, uh, there wasn't any a consistency model uh, applying to the core kernel. So it would just um, set the live pat uh, the, the patch handler to the new um, patch it function, then that was it. But it was very important because this sets the common ground for later uh, improvements to the code. And after this first uh, patch was introduced, uh, many proposals, reviews, and many people got uh, interested into this. This is just uh, some, just to name a few of them. These people, they, they were commenting and reviewing patches and just proposing new ideas how to then finish and, and, and to, to have a workable solution for uh, to be upstream in the kernel. And then two years later, we have this patch introduced to the kernel, which uh, added the consistency model uh, to the upstream kernel. It used uh, the per test consistency model, but the nice thing is that it used a hybrid solution from KGraft and KPatch. So it uses the KGraft uh, per test consistency model, but it also checked the struct, the struct trace to the side uh, whenever a thread, uh, a task, is able to migrate to the new patched state. So that's one of the interesting uh, things about open source is that a lot of solutions are proposed and the community grabs the best ideas and even merge some of the ideas to find the best solution to yeah, that can be applied in a, in a generic way. And so for this to happen, it took two years because uh, at the time, these stack traces, they, they couldn't be uh, trust. I mean, uh, it should have been a, a, a way to ensure that they were trust. And a tool called uh, obj 2 at the time was created and another technology was created just to make sure that the stack traces were reliable and this, this happened in two years. And then after that, this change was possible to be merged. And so now I'll just give you an overview about the consistency model. There are a lot of uh, more in deep details, but just to, give, just to give you an idea about how this works. So let's say that the system is, is running and there is a live patch to be applied, right? To, to solve a vulnerability. So when we apply a live patch, we start a new transition. So the live patch subsystem, what it does, it goes to every running thread. Uh, we say thread and tasks interchangeably here because it's just a uh, context of, of execution. And it sets a, a flag into each thread executing as patch pending. And then it tries to complete the transition. And this complete transition, what it does, it goes to uh, every running, uh, uh, every thread in the in the system, and it checks if that specific thread is calling uh, one of the functions that is being patched. If no, it just clears that uh, flag. And if yes, it just it skips that thread and marks that uh, the transition couldn't be com completed. Uh, so then it so then the, the, the live patch subsystem, it wakes up all the pending threads, those that couldn't be uh, transitioned to the new state, and then it just schedules a new work uh, to try this again in one second. Uh, 
and then if all of them are transitioned, we call this this phase about transition complete, which finishes the life patching procedure. And from this point on, uh, the user is able to apply new life patches on top of this one. And all of this is uh, without any latency problems, without uh, um, any of big constraints that we had in the first two proposals. So this is a big overview over the um, over the functionality of live patching. Um, and so uh, how does it work, right? Uh, so we have three big structures that uh, uh, make the live patching work in this API. First, we have the KOP func, which we declare which functions we are live patching. So uh, each KOP func instance, uh, we, we map one, uh, one function to one replacement function. And so a KOP object, uh, it, it contains a member that is, a, a, is an array of KOP funks. So, and for object, we, we mean uh, VM Linux or module or a module. So if the name is, is no, we just imply that we are live patching a function that lives in the, in the kernel itself, in the VM Linux. Otherwise, the name here uh, means a module like Bluetooth or IPv6 or other modules, uh, other parts of the kernel that are built as, as modules. And then we have the strict KOP patch, which, just, which contains an array of KOP objects. And so this is the, 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 the struct that is passed into the live patch API, which is just, which holds all other information. Um, and so for just to give you an idea, uh, so one KOP patch struct, it can patch multiple functions in multiple different uh, modules, uh, kernel drivers, let's say, or even the Linux itself. So we can have dozens of, of functions being replaced with one live patch, not replaced, but patched, right? And so we use this KOP patch in this KOP enable patch function, and that's it then. And so uh, we in this KOP patch structure, we have this replace member, which is a Boolean. And when it's true, uh, we call that the live patch generated uh, will be applied as an atomic replace. So when we apply this, this patch, it disables all, all previously applied ones. So we usually use this approach when we have uh, dozens of and, and, and tens of uh, fixes. And so every new life patch, it contains the previous applied fixes plus new ones. So when you need to deal with a lot of vulnerabilities uh, like the life patch vendors do, it's easier just to, to manage the life cycle of a kernel that supports life patching doing in this in, in this way. So whenever you have a new life patch, it, it has a cumulative uh, uh, amount of fixes that are applied. On the other hand, if you have this replace set as false, uh, we call this as stacked life patches. They're not stacked uh, in a stack sense, but if uh, every in, uh, life patch is individually managed, so and they uh, you can just uh, apply them and they all live to, together uh, in the kernel. Uh, so uh, this is also a, a, a way of creating fixes. But if you have uh, a kernel version that uh, is a long-term support, it's kind of get difficult to manage in which state uh, every uh, machine is uh, if it's uh, be because you can have vulnerabilities uh, that touch the same function and it's easy to get lost or and to to lose any previous fix with a new one. So I think that for vendors that deal with a large number of uh, a large number of uh, vulnerabilities fixed, they use the atomic replace. Um, so. Uh, how is the upstream currently? So we support officially x86, 64, EPC 64, and S390. Uh, Joe mentioned there are people uh, playing with PPC 32. I'm not sure if that's official, but either way, they are playing with that. 
Uh, ARM64 support is, is still work in progress. There, there has been uh, work being done in the last few years, but yeah, it still, still isn't supported officially. Uh, there are multiple companies also relying on live batch for their uh, server fleets. Like Meta uh, gave a, a talk uh, last Plumbers conference about it, how they are using live patching. But I'm pretty sure that other cloud providers and other big tech companies that are relying on live patch because it's easier than rebooting big machines. And also on upstream currently we have uh, um, been very solid testing uh, on case of tests. And also there is an effort to upstream some out of three tests that are, uh, some, diff some multiple companies are running when releasing a new kernel version. And we are just trying to bring them together to the upstream as well. So everyone could just test the kernel and ensure that it is working when new functionalities is merged. Marcus, so, um, yes? we have uh, three questions. Well, we, we deferred one question, but there are a couple, two other questions in the okay. Q&A. Would you like me to read them out to you? Yes, yes, please. Yes. I think the one that pr uh, probably makes sense to answer now is how this will work in the case of Red Hat Eratus question for Joe. Um, this is about the um, CVEs as you are individual uh, patching or cumulative, add them all together and patching. Okay, so um, let me think for a second how to bring it all together. Um, in the case of a Red Hat Erratic, Kernel, you could think of uh, like a service pack or you know, right, just an update. So it will have a whole range of potential um, fixes. Some of them will be CVEs. Some of them may be customer reported issues that, that are not security issues. Um, so um, for the, the cases of the ones that are CVEs, um, typically right, a vendor may choose to um, live patch a, a subset of those. Um, maybe the most critical and important ones. Um, for one, there are, are hundreds and thousands of, of bugs that could potentially be live patched, but then there's only a subset of those, I think, that are that are probably safe to live patch. Talk about that in a bit. Um, and then in terms of uh, those patches with the, uh, the stacked live patches versus uh, atomic replace, um, in the case of Red Hat's K patch, um, they were initially distributed as stacked patches. Um, so, what um, the way that we would create the content for like the kernel module patch uh, would be to sort of keep adding up the previous, um, the previously known CVEs for that particular um, kernel. So, release one of of the uh, the live patch might have one or two CVEs that were fixed, and then version two of uh, of the same uh, update um, might have the original two um, plus three or four new ones. And so the final state would look like one, two, three, four, or fixed. Um, that said, um, they were now using the atomic replace feature um, in, uh, in, in our distribution in which case the final state would literally look the same. So we're still building uh, patches where the, the first few would have one and two and then, then add new ones. Um, I think for us, the main difference would be if we ever need to uh, remove certain patches from a subsequent version, the atomic replace feature, I think makes that a little bit more tidy. Um, I think there was a slide that, that demonstrated or try to depict that scenario. I think one of the um, the CVEs was essentially dropped from the patch. Um, yes, this one here. Uh, so the kernel provides either you can you know the live patch. Uh, it's one or the other uh, style, which way you want to replace them. So um, I think it's just a different way to sort of get to the same end. And I think um, Atomic Replace was partially motivated to solve a few corner cases, but it was largely modeled after, I think, the way that most vendors were already packaging um, things like CVEs and their live patching. 
So I hope that answers your question. Great. Yeah. Um, come back, Om uh, Singh, if you that hasn't answered your question. And then there is one more interactive live patching to stop tasks, logging and reports from patching question mark. I haven't, I didn't parse that uh, correctly. Um, are you asking a question? Uh, does interactive live patching stop tasks, logging and reports? Maybe that's the question. Does interactive live patching um, stop tasks, logging and reports? No, right. Uh, uh, doesn't stop tasks, and yeah, it's not being uh, um, a, a, a way to stop. Uh, ah, okay. I think yeah, the, the the tasks they are in sleeping state when they are checked, right? All of them they will check these the sleeping tasks, and yeah, they are sleeping, right? If I understood correctly what he he's, he says, uh, he he just wants to know if the tasks are running or not, right? when the life patch is, is, is applied. Is that the, the question? Yeah, I think, Paul, uh, come back and ask clarifying question. I don't think we really understood your question. And then um, um, yeah. that sounds good. And then uh, um, I think that's it for now. Oh, OK, there is one more. If we want to live patch a function that is doing blocking read from the network, does always staying on the task stack, what's the approach? Um, yeah, so uh, I'll just, come, just go back some slides here. So yeah, um, there is still some problems uh, related to, to live patching uh, functions that are continuously called, right? And if I remember correctly, on the it's a more low level detail about the, the consistency model that it, the kernel, so if we have uh, a function that couldn't transition uh, after a few tries, it just sends a fixed signal just for the for the task to stop calling a, a task that is difficult to patch. And just it goes to a signal handler, if I'm not mistaken, and then it is able to, to, to live patch that. Uh, I quite don't remember. Joe, do you have uh, details about that specific cases? But I, as far as I remember, it sends a fake signal to those. Well, I, think, I think there's a mechanism to force um, force the transition, though I, mean, I don't think we really ever use it. Yeah. I think there is uh, into the the core uh, live patching subsystem. And I remember seeing this fake signal just being sent after a few retries that this, this system couldn't transition to a new state. Never seen a case like that before, but that, ex that exists, yeah. Go ahead, Marcos, with the presentation. We have a few more, but we will get uh, answer them later um, in as you next break. Okay. 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 Yeah. So I'm just trying to show an example about uh, live patch, right? And so the, the first example was uh, it's on our samples directory for live patching. So I'm just trying to to live patch the command line uh, prop file, right? So this and this is the function that is called when you read the file slash proc slash command line file. Um, and it just prints out the command line used to boot the kernel from our boot from our bootloader. And so uh, how we said uh, when live batching a function, we just need to have the same function fixed. But at this point, we just need to, to show uh, this working. So we just change the message for a fixed string like this has been live patched. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, a new, uh, this is a different function, but with the same prototype. So it's the same return type, it's the same arguments uh, used and same argument types with just a different uh, message being printed out. And you can see this file on the samples directory from the kernel source code. And so we have this left patch command line proc show function. And first we register that on the KOP func uh, structure uh, array, right? And the old name is the original name from the function. And also, as we've shown before, uh, we just create a KOP object and we assign that functions to, 
to this object. Then we create a KOP patch, which also assigns the objects array to that. And as we mentioned before, uh, a live patch is, is just uh, a kernel module, like a driver, like yeah, other code in the kernel that you compile as not built in. And so we have normal init and exit entry points, like a normal module would do. But there is one interesting catch here that you need to add this module info live patch uh, information. Uh, otherwise, the kernel module, um, the kernel module loader, uh, it wouldn't uh, assign a, uh, an information on the module uh, that's saying that this is a live patch. So later on, when the live patch subsystem checks that we are trying to register a new live patch without this being a live patch module, it would fail. So, so this module info live patch is is really needed. So now I just show uh, a demo right now. Um, can you see my screen, right? Uh, I'll just start the VM using the virtme uh, machine, which does a QMU wrapper, right? So first of all, let me clean the DMASG. So DMASG is now empty. So then I will read the pro command line file. And we can see here it's just uh, uh, the, the command line used to boot this, this virtual machine. And now let me just load the this live patch sample. It's, it is the same code that I showed before. And when you do that, so yeah, the command executed. When you go to see dmask, and first thing that we say is we taint the kernel because we are changing the, the running kernel. So this is expected. Uh, the patch was enabled. Uh, it started the transition and it and it transitioned later on. Uh, it took almost two seconds here, but this is expected. This is a VM. And so if we do the same cat uh, from the command line, we see that this has been live patched. So we patched that function. So right now, whenever we read this file, it will detour from the original function to the patched one, right? So we can also now disable the, the live patch. Hmm. Sometimes the demo gods, they have no, no mercy, right? So, uh, yeah. So <laughs> now we can just disable the live patch, right? Okay. We can see the mask. And we can see that it started that unpatching transition and then it's completed after that. And just reading the file gives the same command line as before. So we apply the patch and we unpatch the kernel later on. So it's pretty uh, easy to, to, do, to do that. And so the code can be seen here. I've patched sample.c, which is the same code that just showed on these slides, right? So you can check that in your kernel tree or on the web. OK. So now we have the slides, which just show the same output from a different machine, just for you to read later on if you are interested. OK, so now I would just show an example of a CVE that has a, a very simple fix that can also be as simple to create a live patch. So there is this, this CVE that was opened uh, last year, or the, the bug existed last year. And it, it just patches one function on the Bluetooth module. Uh, the fix is very straightforward. Uh, it just changes one function. This function is not inline or static, so the, at least the compiler shouldn't mess up with the this, this symbol. It should be traceable then. And for this case, it, it would be similar from that sample code that I showed you uh, to, to create a live patch. So for this example, uh, it shouldn't be very hard to create the live patch manually, right? So now I just pass to Joe to explain uh, a different case when creating a live patch. Sure. So I think previous examples were fairly straightforward. You had small, small checks that maybe just completely changed the implementation or maybe only needed to um, add a function call or something like a null pointer check. Um, and I would just say a surprising number of kernel CVEs are are based in, in, in that just, you know, null pointer check or, or something simple like that. Um, that said, 
there are a reasonable number that um, start to get more complicated. And I think one of the, like the first level of, of complications um, come into play when patches start changing data structures or data semantics. Um, and so one, I think, really good example was uh, just commit from many years ago, um, in which had it added a spin lock member to um, a, an a SDA info structure. And so right, the implication um, of that is you, you know you change the header file probably um, which changes the right, definition and layout of the structure and then you'll all go and, and change functions that do need to take and release this lock. So you'll end up with not only the code changes to deal with the lock, but if you're um, introducing things in the middle of structures, you're starting to change offsets. And so any code that's dealing with maybe the rest of the structure um, sort of would get modified as well. Um, so this, I think this sort of issue was very clear and obvious even um, in, in Jeff's case splice paper uh, in the beginning, um, how to deal with this problem. So one, one solution um, that has been merged upstream um, is the introduction of uh, so-called shadow variables. Um, and I'll we'll get into that in a second, but um, the sort of rule here is that in live patching, um, your patch has to handle structures were created before your patch, but then they also need to handle ones that are created and you know, while your patch is loaded. Um, so what do you do? So the kernel um, has an API that facilitates dealing with this problem. It's got shadow variables. Um, and the, there's a slide link here um, in the documentation to the API. But this is sort of at a high level um, how it would work. So on the left-hand side, this would be the traditional kernel patch, which changed the definition of the structure and the layout, and therefore all the all the code that deals with that. Um, shadow variables allow you to sort of still deal with all of the original style structures, but then using a hash table, you can associate those and new ones that you've created uh, with additional data that, that the patch needs to work with. So in this case, it was uh, uh, this PS lock, uh, spin lock. Um, so essentially, you, you're not changing the original or, or new data layout. You're sort of associating it with something that's allocated separately. And there's two, I think, two main styles of um, sort of working through this uh, this technique. First one would be to allocate this shadow data or shadow variable at the same time that you're allocating its parent or associated data structure. Um, this works well if you have data structures that uh, are frequently created, get released. Um, so you could sort of say, well, all right, um, for the data structures that were created and before the patch was loaded, I let them age out. And then once we work with all of our new data structures, we will be considered patched. And um, the way that you would need to modify uh, kernel patches to translate them into live patches would sort of be to work indirectly with the new data, so that the shadow data here. So on the right-hand side, it's sort of a very summarized version of this. Um, in this case, it was a, a SAA info structure parent structure that is allocated in this um, info alloc function. At the same time, you would say, well, give me one of these shadow variables. It's as large as a spin lock. And then basically um, associate the pointer of the original structure and some kind of enumeration to describe it. Um, and then you can query sort of that hash table database throughout the code to say, okay, if you have one of these shadow variables, you know, get me its um, its pointer, and then instead of allocating or I'm sorry, instead of initializing or, or taking the lock directly, you would just take it on your separately allocated version of that. The same thing would occur when you need to release um, the parent structure. So there's an equivalent uh, probably release function or free function for the STA info structure. At the same time, you would say if there's a shadow variable associated with it, uh, 
free that one at the same time. That's fairly straightforward. The other technique might be to create the shadow variables on the fly. Uh, maybe they're not frequently allocated. Maybe they were created at boot time or load time, um, or simply they all of them need to be, you know, uh, sort of amended to solve a, a CVE. In which case, what you might do um, alternatively, right, is to say, well, um, when you're actually using the spin log, so in this case, there's a IEEE 8 bazillion deliver wake up function. Uh, it needs to take take that PS lock. Well, uh, before you do that, say, um, get me get me get me the shadow variable if it's already exists, or allocate one for me. And just like the the other example, you need the spin lock size. You need a pointer to the parent structure, um, as well as um, how you want to initialize it. So. Um, in this version, on the right hand side, the uh, that shadow alloc or get or alloc function will take a constructor for your uh, constructor function for your um, your shadow variable. In this case, it's a simple spin lock initialize. This may or may not be simpler than the previous version. Uh, the previous technique it's really up to I think the live patch uh, author or translator. In that case, uh, explaining the shadow variable um, API was chosen very carefully because I think um, it was fairly straightforward to explain why you need it, how you would use it. Um, and so it's kind of you know more complicated. It's not it's not so simple as the kernel patch. It requires some more um, some more review, um, but it may be doable. And it's. I think both of us would just want to sort of say how this is a somewhat slippery slope. Um, you might start off thinking, oh, this life patching, it's as easy as the command line example. In a lot of cases, it might be no pointer check. It's usually not that complicated. As you keep patching more and more functions and seeing more CVEs, you have to do, use more things like shadow variables um, or maybe some other techniques that, that sort of are outside the scope of, of our talk today. Um, it might turn into what some would call rocket surgery. You've got all these balls in the air because you're patching so many CVEs. What do you do about like, upgrading patches or removing patches? Um, get complicated fast. Um, OK, yeah, just taking back and so now I would like to talk about limitations, about creating live patches and possible problems that can happen. And they really can, yeah. Sometimes we craft live patches and when testing, we just discover something interesting uh, when creating different live patches on different machines and sometimes things can explode in your face. <laughs> so, yeah. So now I'll just uh, explain some limitations and some problems that might arise when we limitations per se, but things that you need to take care of when creating live patches. So I just show some examples here. Uh, so the first one is, is a CVE that patched low level architecture code. Um, so uh, when creating this live patch, I checked that the function was there. It wasn't static. I don't remember it being static or inlined, but somehow the symbol to, to F trace to live patch wasn't present in the VM Linux. So then, yeah, I checked the make file and then um, the make file itself disabled tracing in the entire file. And so these things, they happen usually on the low level architecture code and other uh, like uh, the perf subsystem two, it disables some, some files or some functions and also in the F trace. So it disables tracing the tracer, which is understood. <laughs> well, why this is a bad idea. Uh, but then, so this is something that uh, you need to check when creating a live patch because yeah, you can't patch this file then. What you can do is just uh, create the live patch in another way, get the topmost color that is patchable from that function and that's it. So you just need to check and to 
analyze very carefully where to put the fix. And sometimes the fix for the live patch is completely different from the upstream patch because of situations like this. And also when you disable the live patching for the entire file when compiling, it just omits that five byte F trace hook that Joe explained before. And so F trace isn't able to, to, to hook into that function to live patch it. So there is a second example here about uh, aggressive inlining. There is this DRM driver that contains a lot of functions that are stated as inline or static. And just grab one example. The fix itself contains uh, changes for a lot of functions. And, but for this specific one, I just grabbed this one to, to show you off. Uh, so this GB shader in it, it, this function is inlined into the VMW user shader alloc and into this other uh, VMW shader alloc. But one of those on the left, it's inlined into a different function. And on the right, it, it is optimized by the compiler. So long story short, I had to live patch the shader define a Yocto and compatch shader add functions instead. So imagine that you have a live patch touching like say 15 functions and each one of them is in line into diff in five different functions. So things can get pretty big fast. Um, and so this, this happens from time to time. And also what you need to do in these cases of inline, you just need to patch the topmost traceable functions, right? And sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not. So that really depends on the fix and on the compiler uh, uh, used and the compiling options also. So just a summary of things that can can uh, make it more difficult to create live patches in this case. So also some functions uh, it contain uh, some functions contain the no trace macro, which as the name implies disables tracing for that specific function, which which is not inlining per se, but yeah, you need to patch the colors uh, of that function. Sometimes you have a function that is untraceable, like this example. Uh, the IOV eater uh, fix. Uh, it, it is untraceable as well, and it's inlined in several exported functions. And this is the case when you patch some code that is very deep into the stack that is used by some uh, low level base functions. In this case, too, they, they require deep analysis about uh, where to put the fix. Uh, also, which is more common for live batch vendors is when you create live batches for multiple architectures. So one thing that can easily uh, give you bad results is about endianness. So depending on how you create your live batches, depending on the tool, uh, some macros can be resolved on the, on the machine you are creating the live patch. Uh, so some endianness uh, checks, uh, they are done uh, on the host machine, but when you compile and run on the target machine, it gives you bad results and even complex problems to, to solve. And so that's something that you need to take care of. Um, also, when you are patching static functions, uh, the compiler is free to inline those into different functions depending uh, on the other compiler options that you give. And also one thing to, to, to remember is that different compilers on different architectures have different inlining behaviors. So using almost the same uh, uh, compiling, uh, uh, the compiler flags on x86, on S390, uh, some symbols can be uh, inlined or optimized in different architectures. That happens from time to time when creating live patches that you rely on a symbol that exists on, on x86 but when you apply the live patch on S390, it complains that the symbol isn't there because it was optimized. So yeah, that 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 happens. Um, so what you should do basically is just to generate the same live patch in these two different machines and compare them if they are the same or if they are not, just adjust your tool or your manual, your manually crafted live patch. And also, as I said, some code is differently optimized in different architectures. Symbols can be missing on, on different, uh, on the same kernel on different machines. 
So the main advice that I would like to, to leave is that handcrafted live patches may be dangerous. Consider using a tool. Uh, there are some tools to, to create live patches. Just, just check that out. Uh, we are planning a, a, a session about that in the future, right, Joe? And yeah, but for now, uh, creating simple live patches, yeah, it's okay, it's, it's fine. Uh, but when you start creating multiple level patches, touching multiple code can get difficult very easily. So uh, there are some references for, for some live patch tests that we're trying to upstream from the kpatch patch author uh, guide, which details some uh, interesting information and also more details than we, we gave at this presentation. And also the live patch, the live patching mailing list, which people send new features and fixes for the live patching. So if you might get interested into that, just take a look into the mailing list. And then I gave back to Kenneth for questions. Sorry, uh, we have several questions um, in the chat that we deferred, q and I will start with the first one. Would it be necessary to reboot and fall back to regular patch upgrade procedure if the live patches pile up too much? I think we deferred this question um, to, and then would you like to answer that now, Joe or Marcos? I'll answer since I deferred. Um, I think my answer was it depends. So mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think um, I mean, fundamentally, like, like my, I think my philosophy would be that we really do want you to reboot at some point. Um, I think the Linux kernel itself is not, it's not generally designed to be live patched, right? It's designed to sort of be efficient and what is on the mind of most 99.99% .99 of kernel developers is that you have rebooted the machine, right? So I think, um, so it is inherently assumed that that is what you're doing. So I think, um, is it necessary to reboot if they if they pile up too much? Well, I don't know if we've reached the technical limit um, of saying, well, is there like a thousand patches too many or, or something like that? Um, I think at some point it does become difficult for a live patch um, author or maintainer to maybe track all the changes and review the changes. Um, and Generally, live patch fixes are, are originate from kernel fixes, right? Well, the kernel fix was reviewed by a very large kernel community, um, and then the uh, live patch is obviously reviewed by you know, whoever wrote it, and you know, spreads it out. So, um, I think at some point it makes sense to reboot. Um, but as far as I think, like fundamental technical limits, I I don't know what they are off the top of my head. Um, I think it comes down to uh, scheduling. There's probably other reasons um, and other things that are related to rebooting a machine, um, creating bazillion shadow variables. There's overhead involved in that. Um, mm -hmm. Likewise, right. I think somebody was saying that in the chat that. Uh... Uh, too many uh, active live patches can cause slowdown. Have you any thoughts on uh, the slowdown aspect of that, Joe? I suppose that would be a similar question to running ftrace on um, tons mm -hmm. of um, you know functions. Uh, I think tr trying to show you, um, I remember the the replace and accumulating more patches uh, over time. And, and so that the life patch subsystem supports that uh, and you can patch uh, the same function in, in version one of a patch as a version 10, right? Um, and I believe the way the subsystem will arrange that is the, the last patch that's loaded, um, their version of the replacement detour function will take hold. So you're not like, you're not, as you load new patches that touch the same files, you're not introducing X number of redirections. It's only the last thing that, that takes account. Um, yeah. 
there is another uh, 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 chat. So please post it to everyone when you do that. Um, but there is one for hosts and panelists that said it's it's just an extra jump from the pointer in that five bytes header, correct? Is that, I think they are saying in response to slowing down part that would it, is it, is is the performance a factor if it is just a jump? Um, there's the cost writing occurring that yeah. I suppose the um, the locality, right? This you're jumping to something that is brought in from a module versus whatever, you know, maybe another module or the kernel. Um, and you do have an F trace handler. Try to minimize that as much as possible. Basically looks to see about that that flag that, that Marcos talked about. But you know, the handler is just sort of the gatekeeper. Do you run new code? Do you run old code? That's its sole responsibility. So you could probably look at that and it's a couple, you know, couple lines of uh, code, I believe. So yeah. So what would make me nervous probably is that how you you might have in a large data center, you might have several servers. So that's the whole idea of this light patch, right? So that you don't have to uh, bring systems down and be able to um, continue without taking the without suffering the downtime. But at the same time, if you have multiple servers at different live patch versions, then maintaining that might also be problematic. Maybe that is the reason to um, schedule um, a downtime to upgrade systems and use live patch for as a, um, a quick stop gap me measure. Would that be accurate or am I totally off on that? Sure, I, I, all from my point of view, I think a major motivation, right, are the, mm -hmm. the CVEs that pop up um, in between your reboot schedule. You know, I think um, if you have maybe some modern architected fleet where, you know, you can sort of migrate or, or partially take down and reboot things and that works, that's awesome. But um, there are scenarios where that's not the case and maybe there are scheduled reboots um, every quarter or every month, things like that. And so in that case, system administrator, um, can be empowered with live patch saying, well, at least you know, instead of maybe having to do an emergency reboot um, and all of that entails, I can kind of, you know, hold, hold myself over till, uh, till the regularly scheduled reboot. Um, yeah, and then get everybody running. Yeah. The same base kernel instead of having the, all these live patches in effect. Right. All right. So thank you, Joe. Uh, the next um, question is, even though case flies is, code is closed, is there a comparison between KCraft, KPatch, and case flies? Just curious if they use the same approach and how they differ. Thank you for a, the fantastic webinars. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, at today's start, I think that uh, KGraphs was very different from from KSplice. I mean, in the because KSplice uses that stop machine, uh, which is much more similar to KPatch. But I'm not sure if we still can compare the solutions, right, Joe? Because they have been closed since uh, 2011, so I'm not sure if they are still using that or if they are relying on the upstream with kind of a special sauce from case wise what do you think uh, right i was going to say the same thing i don't think we can speak to how case place is implemented um these days um i'm i'm sure oracle would be eager to tell you from a feature standpoint maybe you know why this is different or you know why this is better than upstream so that probably exists Okay, so the other question is we kind of touched on this before, interactive live paging, patching to stop tasks, logging and report from patching. I think um, they were saying um, whether it's you have logging going on um, during that time. Um, and then uh, while I do want clarification on that question, I, I was, I'm not clear, but there is another question from Paul. Um, the patcher is waiting for tasks to stop before applying the patch. Can the blocking tasks be stopped manually? Uh, 
when you say stop manually, yeah, if you kill that that <laughs> bending task, I think that will help the transition. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, other way, you just need to yeah. If if there is a, a, a heavily called um, function that isn't preempted, I think that that can just uh, complicate the tra the transition. I think, but there is that fake signal feature. If I remember correctly, it sends this fixed signal every 15 tries, if I remember correctly, just to try. So, and if I remember correctly, the kernel sends a fixed signal to the specific thread and it kind of detours from the execution, uh, from executing uh, a call to help transition into the, uh, to the live patched state, I think. But yeah, otherwise, if the problematic, um, thread doesn't exist anymore next time it tries to transition yeah then yeah it to transition i guess the question is is it safe to kill it but i guess if it's not working right it could be so there is another question um that says admins uh, paul uh, from Paul, admins should be aware of cases when patching can create corruption and may require a system rescue i recently had an update that did that any comments on that one? I think it's more of a statement than a question, but. My advice would be like, um, it's as if loading any other kernel module, I would I'd hope maybe you'd smoke tests a little bit, but the, I mean, the aim of a live patch is to ensure stability. So I think most vendors err on the side of trying not to overstep the, you know, into the, the complex, uh, you know, fix zone. So if there's something that introduces corruption, that's certainly worth um, reporting back to, you know, wherever you got the, the live patch. Another question is, what about the new Rust kernel modules? Can they be, can those be patched in the same or similar way? Which kernel module, sorry, Shua? Rust. Rust ones. Oh, okay. I think um, at least I haven't seen any discussion about it uh, in the mailing list yet. Um, I'm not really sure. Have you seen something like that, Joel? Oh, I think the conversation would start with um, can you F trace into Rust kernel modules? That's where I would start, mm. right? Because we would probably need to drop, uh, you know, get, get hooked into those functions. Um, Beyond that, I don't really know much about the Rust sort of model. So I think that might be the same for most of the live patching subsystem. So I think it's it's like on the far radar, but it's not not something that you would see this year or next year, probably. Yeah, you have to have dependencies met first, of course. Um, yeah. yeah. Of course. Sounds good. Okay, so the other question, I think that's the last one in the Q&A. Is it possible to roll back live kernel patch in live, not reboot. Yes, Marcos did it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did he, he, right. I think this question probably, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, Marcos showed how it, and he showed that it, um, you can roll it back and then get back to your original function with the command line, showing that it's the command line also changes proc. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, uh, if you have stacked live patches, you can just unload them in an arbitrary order. So if you have 10 stacked live patches, they are not related. And yeah, you can uh, unpatch each of them in a different time. Uh, yeah, that just works, yeah. So when, when you showed two models, it's kind of a my follow on, uh, on question to the same thing um the when you showed um how you could combine a few and then patch cves individual versus um com combined so for rolling back it might be beneficial to have them um individual so that you could roll back easily just like bisect i mean as i was thinking and listening to you talk about individual versus combined i was thinking about bisecting and being able to revert patches. So just like source code, we revert patches, it becomes easier if they are not combined. Is that is that a right observation or, you know, not a good comparison? 
So I think the rollback is fundamentally could be difficult um, mm -hmm. because you have a very similar scenario as I talked about in the shadow variable case, right? Where you have um, patches that change data semantics. So just like those patches have to handle data structures from both worlds, if you want to support un, uh, unloading these patches, then you have, then your patch has to, I guess, leave the system state safe for an unpatched kernel to operate in. Um, and so I think what are, this might get really complicated is when you have multiple, um, multiple patches that are contributing to a shared system state. Mm. And um, it is possible that say multiple CVEs might um, need to patch the same function. Uh, and if these are released uh, separately over time, how do you yeah, orchestrate well, which combination is the one that you want to end up in? And then the way I sort of works today, I think by convention is the vendors are sort of stacking these up. So every, you know, the latest patch will include all of the CVE fixes for a particular function. The previous patch would include, you know, a smaller subset, et cetera. So I think it becomes organizationally and work <laughs> to, to <laughs> the map out all the potential states. Right, it, right, yeah. Yeah, so you're saying do it at your own. I mean, you want to be careful because you are right. The same function could be uh, four CVEs might change the function. In that case, how do you determine um, the order? Is that also part of the live patching tools that you will be covering in the next one? Um, well, I, I think it's more of a, um, yeah, how are you creating your patch? So, well, I can speak to how it works at that. At Red Hat, generally, we will have um, maybe a set of CVEs that release in, say, version one of a patch, then another set in version two. So version one gets checked into a tree. It looks like a kernel tree with the live patches like on top. So then when we create the second set of patches that may, may need to lay on top of the previous patches, um, they take that into account. So it's sort of baked into, I think, the the sort of the, the creation of the patch. It's like the subsequent ones are literally based on the previous source code, uh, if that makes sense. Okay. I think that answers my question. Um, don't think we have any questions in the chat, but go ahead, Marcos. Yeah, you probably want to talk about how you do that in at SUSA. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just two two things is that on on the first one that you said, okay, how you 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 define an ordering for stacking life patches, right? So that can also get complicated. So if you uh, let's say you have patch A that touches a function, patch B and patch C, right? So if you go there and I mean, depending on the order of the life patches that you apply, you can also introduce new new issues that mm. weren't fixed, right? So okay. and then you can have a, a stack trace that, okay, yeah, this can't happen because we have this check here. So the, depending on, on how you, you, you unpatch uh, your kernel, you may introduce bugs that doesn't exist to anybody else. So I think that's also, <laughs> yeah. So and, that, and, and that's one of the things that, that the atomic replace helps uh, dealing with because you have or patch state or not patch state, right? And uh, I, I never seen any uh, customer to uh, unpatch a system to this day. So, yeah, as I think that people test that a lot and try to not break things as the question, uh, as the person asked. And for the live patch creation tool, uh, our um, our live patches we we don't um, uh, depend on any on any module on any previous applied live patch. Uh, so whenever we need to to patch uh, uh, a function for a model, we, we for this time we use in chaos sims. So we don't uh, require the module to be loaded when applying. So yeah, so we 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 don't depend on any previously applied patch or in, in any loaded module to 
So that's how we do it in Susan. Great. Um, and I think what I'm hearing you're saying is uh, that also the fact, the fact that um, that live patch um, gen patches generated uh, for a live patch aren't reviewed by wider audience. So you do want to, um, at some point in time, use it use it uh, for patching something quickly in between reboot schedules. I think that's kind of what I heard from Joe for sure. And then I think that that is Marcos. That's that's kind of what I think too. That probably would make me nervous because of that factor of not having been reviewed widely. And you were just your machine could be the one that running that particular flavor of the kernel. That could be a lonely problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Lonely problem to solve. Yeah. Yes, that's. Um, I will say that. So there are other folks who use live patching a little differently. We did allude to Meta. Mm -hmm. Um, guys from Facebook, a great presentation at, at the last farmers conference. You could probably find it online. They use it to test out, I think, some new features and new code. Mm. And a live patching mechanism was just an easier way for them to roll it out, I think, into their fleet uh, or retract it if it didn't work. So I think like a an ordinary, I guess, rollout um, had a lot of overhead and probably a lot of sign-offs, but maybe the live patching was a little bit quicker uh on the iteration side so um, oh yeah so uh, during testing process so okay, yes, yeah. yes maybe maybe more optimistic way to think about it than to saying yeah oh i should have them come and do the talk webinar probably at some point so that'll be nice okay um i not seeing any questions in the chat or um Oh, okay. There is just one showed up. How would live patching affect running DB database, I'm assuming, on a system? Well, uh, same way it, it interacts with other uh, processes, right? So it's just normal tracing. So if you're running F-trace, yeah, it should interfere, I mean, give big latencies because of the way that the current upstream live patch is uh, uh, subsystem is architectured. So yeah, so it's not specific for, for a database, but yeah, you, you shouldn't feel any big uh, latency or any interference from when applying a live patch. I don't see how that would be different for a database, let's say. That is the last question I have seen. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Any last comments from either one of you before we uh, hand it back to Candice? Uh, not from my side, no. I guess just stay tuned. We hope to do maybe a follow-up presentation on uh, a little bit more on the, the live patch generation tooling. So the user space side um, you know, how do we use these tools to either mitigate or avoid some of the uh, the complexity problems um, that arise? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that will be scheduled soon. Stay tuned for that. And then looks like there is one that just came up. Is live patching supported in a pacemaker cluster? Last question, I guess, we'll say take. I suppose support it might have different definitions. Um, is it technically support it? Uh, I believe as long as the, the kernels that are running in that environment have the configuration um, set, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Um, is it supported by a vendor? That's a whole other question. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think, no. I mean, um, Candice, we have, uh, how long do we have left? I don't think there are any questions. So, yeah. Yeah, we just Back. have about three minutes left. So um, if you guys want to wrap up, though, we can definitely wrap up. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions la um, show up. There is a hand up. Um, Savod, is that? 
um yeah okay i think i think all done candace okay perfect uh thank you so much marcos joe and shua for your time today and thank you everyone for joining us as a reminder this recording will be on the linux foundation's youtube page later today and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the linux foundation website we hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions have a wonderful day thank you